Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. You're getting two for the price of one today, because they're, well, kind of short. Well, the first one's kind of short, for reasons which will become obvious as you watch it. Uh, the second one, well, the battle itself lasted the regular amount of time, but uh, we're going to be cutting it down and focusing on the interesting bits. In the meantime, this is Comp Avalanche in the German Tier 7 battlecruiser, the Prince Heinrich. He's top tier in a tier 7 domination battle here on the Seychelles map, although none of that is really important. And even though this battle is kind of short to begin with, we're even going to be skipping the first couple of minutes because it does take some time before we actually find some targets to shoot at. So we're going to skip ahead to where the fun starts happening. And that would be around about here with a minute and a half of the battle elapsed. No casualties yet inflicted, both teams still only have the one cap circle each that they started with. And Comp Avalanche has gotten spotted. Now there are two submarines and three destroyers in play on each team, so it's extremely likely, especially given that cap circle Charlie and Delta are now being flipped by the enemy team and there's a very very suspicious looking smoke screen over there. It's extremely likely that he's gotten spotted by at least one of those destroyers or submarines and the fact that he is still spotted despite the obvious destroyer ahead of him smoking up, because of course smoke screens work both ways. You can't see into a smoke screen, but the ship in the smoke screen can't see out of him, and the fact that he is still spotted would indicate that there's very likely more than one of them up ahead. Destroyers, submarines, we don't know, but there's something else there. And since obvious destroyer is obvious, Comp Avalanche uses his hydro, and sure enough, torpedoes here come the torpedoes. Us. Now, he's heading nose in, so, got the maximum possible chance of dodging these torpedoes. Unfortunately, that's when the enemy Piotr Veliki pops up on his flank. And he's basically given a flat broadside. Oh, he's going to hit one of those torpedoes, maybe. Yeah, nearly 13,000 damage. Could have been a lot worse, though. Fortunately, that guy did not have his guns pointing this way, because, well, Comp Avalanche kind of has to keep nose into the torpedo threat, which means he's given a flat broadside to that guy's guns. The Piotr Veliki has now noticed that there's a German battlecruiser over here, giving him a nice, big, fat, juicy broadside to shoot at. There were two more torpedoes over there, which just hit the island. Very poorly aimed torpedoes, but the fact that there were only two indicates the presence of, sure enough, well, at least one enemy submarine. Double Citadel scored on the Russian battleship over there, off camera. He's not having a very good day. Comp Avalanche gets his depth charges away at the Undyne that got spotted up ahead, and those depth charges are going to absolutely ruin that submarine. There's more submarine torpedoes coming from the other side. His depth charges get the kill. The Akatsuki in the smoke screen up ahead has gotten torpedoes away. This is going to be tight. He might be lucky and get away with eating only one of them. He does, but it's another 13,000 damage taken. He could have done without. He failed to finish off the Piotr Veliki. Gets another salvo out, but the Piotr Veliki gets to return fire and slap his broadside before... Comp Avalanche's shells land home, which didn't end up killing him anyway, although he is immediately finished off by another teammate, so he's not able to follow up with a second and probably fatal salvo. The Akatsuki is um, taking his time getting out of there, and he's dead. Meanwhile, Comp Avalanche's secondary has been opening up on... Um, you know, I actually had to look that thing up. I've never heard of it. Turns out it's a Battle Pass reward, which explains why I've never heard of it, because screw Battle Passes. Anyway... Not quite sure where he thinks he's going, or how quickly he's going to get there by reversing. Uh, those shots were a little high, nothing but overpens on his superstructure. Torpedoes away because, hey, you never know your luck. It's French though, so it's going to have torpedoes of its own. French cruisers typically tend to have torpedoes with a 9km range. Hydra's on cooldown, but, well, you know, obvious torpedoes are obvious. Yep, sure enough, there they are. That guy's now... I'm not sure what he's trying to do, but I guarantee it's going to get him killed because it's a tier 6 light cruiser. <laughs> and like tier 5 light cruisers, they're all made out of citadels. There's, oh, hey, well, I was about to comment on the position of the Maestral over there, but hey, it's dead, so it doesn't really matter. The enemy team are now down to 8 points, by the way. <laughs> They were actually down to four points before the enemy team got their first kill of the game. After suffering seven casualties, they just got their first kill of the game by depth charging a submarine. Four points. 
Uh, uh, they were threatening, well, they held one and they were threatening another two of the cap circles. Now they basically only just got the one cap circle they started with. They've only got five ships left. You know how this one's going to end, don't you? <laughs> He's now in a gunfight with a full health Gneiser now. And he only has 13,000 health left. Al knows. Surely he am doomed. <laughs> Don't worry. It's a Gneiser now. The only thing that thing's going to get any hits is if somebody dies and leaves them to it in its will. Um... <laughs> Oh, Comp Avalanche has gotten his heel off as well. Ah, this'll be fine. It's actually not the fight over here between Comp Avalanche and the Gneiser now that's going to be significant. Have a look. Let me zoom in on the map. Oh, Gneiser now has just lost a third of its firepower <laughs> with a single gun turret knocked out. <laughs> now it only has four guns that couldn't hit the side of a barn from the inside. Um... <laughs> Right, the enemy team are now down to 13 points after losing yet another ship. There are only four of them left, but this battle is going to be decided right over on the eastern map border, over there. Look at that dog pile. <laughs> There's one enemy submarine there, desperately trying to burrow his way through the map border, and he's just getting piled on, but now he's dead. That's it. Enemy team reduced to zero points. Comp Avalanche's team win by 747 points and only suffered a single casualty and they only took seven minutes to do it you can see why you're getting two for the price of one today can't you <laughs> i couldn't put this up in its entirety and justify it as a daily video so yeah and all of this of course because i said you know you hardly ever see teams getting reduced to zero points and you guys took that as a personal challenge so, yeah. Anyway, moving on swiftly. Today's second battle, for your viewing pleasure, I mean, it's also a domination battle. It's on the trap map, but other than that, entirely different. For a start, it's significantly higher tier. This is Gapman CA in the premium tier 9 American battleship, the USS Missouri. The Missouri, famously, comes with radar. It's one of the few battleships that does, and also, famously, Prince money. It has a ridiculous credit earning coefficient. Wargaming have tried numerous times over the years to, as dishonestly as possible, try to nerf the amount of money that the USS Missouri makes, but they keep getting caught and called out by the community and forced to walk back all of the, let's be generous and call them changes. It's still an amazing money maker. It's basically an Iowa with radar. It's a good ship. The Missouri was introduced in a collaboration with, um, you know, I was going to say the actor, Steven Seagal, but that would be doing a disservice to actual actors. He became famous during the 80s and 90s as an action movie star, and thanks largely due to the success of the admittedly pretty good movie Under Siege, which was set on board the USS Missouri, hence the collaboration between World of Warships and Steven Seagal. In the movie, he played the role of disgraced former U.S. Navy SEAL, Chief Petty Officer Casey Ryback, who, after being kicked out of the SEALs, could only be retained in the Navy at the rank of Chief Petty Officer and in the post of Chief Cook, where he played the captain's personal chef on board the ship. The ship, of course, taken over by terrorists, yada, yada, yada. And so the Chief Cook basically had to kick lots and lots of terrorist arse and save the day. It wasn't a bad movie. Hence the collaboration between the USS Missouri, here in World of Warships, and Steven Seagal, the alleged actor. All of the captain's voice lines for the Missouri used to be voiced by none other than Steven Seagal himself. Unfortunately, the collaboration between World of Warships and Seagal happened during the later stage of Seagal's movie career, the stage where he just didn't give a shit. <laughs> and listening to his voice lines, it kind of showed, because he sounded like he was drugged. Um, or drunk, or possibly both. It was hilarious. I mean, they were so badly voice acted, although no worse than his actual on-screen acting. But you could quite clearly tell that he'd just been given his voice lines and he just didn't care. Just get this done and out of the way and give me my goddamn check, <laughs> right? I mean, it was, it was hilarious. There also used to be a little animated character who would wander around the upper deck of the Missouri 
dressed in chef's whites. I mean, clearly a reference to the movie Under Siege. All of that, of course, very quickly got removed when revelations hit the media, and honestly, nobody was surprised whatsoever about just what exactly a colossal arsehole Steven Seagal really was. Um, and if you've seen any of the movies that he's made in the last 15 years, this will come as no surprise whatsoever to anybody. He's infamous for injuring stuntmen because he doesn't seem to understand that there's a difference between real fighting and movie fighting. The only way you can tell for sure that you're actually seeing Steven Seagal on screen in any of his recent movies is if he's sitting down, because any time he has to stand up or, heaven forbid, actually fight somebody, there's always a body double. <laughs> you know, somebody who can actually move without waddling. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, it also seems to be written into his contract um, that he gets to, while fully clothed, of course, because nobody wants to see Steven Seagal naked, while fully clothed, he gets to molest at least one extremely unfortunate young European actress in every movie that he makes. Oh, and his voice acting as well. Well, I mean, technically not really voice acting. He's on screen. You can see his lips moving. You just can't make any sense of what's coming out of his mouth. <laughs> he just kind of mumbles his lines at the camera, and you can't understand a word he's saying. So they actually have to hire a voice actor to dub his lines into recognisable English, which gives you some idea of just how bad his voice lines were in World of Warships as well. So, yeah, top collaboration there, Wargaming. Great choice. Next, premium version of the USS Alabama. Captain Lines, voiced by none other than serial rapist Bill Cosby. Although, to be fair to Wargaming, nobody really knew what a colossal asshole. Steven Seagal was at the time that they signed the collaboration deal. Well, they should have. I mean, the clues were all there. He's also a massive liar. I mean, like, a legendarily massive liar. He used to claim that he did covert operations for the CIA. <laughs> Knowing, of course, full well, there's no way the CIA were ever going to confirm or deny any of his bullshit. Jingles, there's, there's nothing happening in this battle. Why? Well, I was going to cut all of this stuff out, but then I would have lost the opportunity to talk shit about Steven Seagal. Torpedoes, <laughs> direct front. <laughs> Don't worry. You know, it's going to be worth it. In the meantime, let's talk some more shit about Steven Seagal. I'm actually enjoying this. This is great. So he's legendarily stupid as well, by the way. He was shooting this movie once called Cradle to the Grave with Tom Arnold, DMX, a bunch of other people I can't remember. And um, they're filming this one scene on board a houseboat. It's an actual houseboat, so, you know, it's docked. So there's a dock on one side and there's an open river on the other side. And because he's just so amazingly stupid and lazy, he couldn't be asked to block out the scene before they started shooting. So the director's trying to get you know, everything blocked out so everybody knows where to stand and what to do. And he's just, you no, know, roll the cameras. But we haven't, roll it. So they start filming. He opens the door, steps out, falls into the river. <laughs> and as he comes up spluttering for air, his face is black with all of the ink running from his hair. Because, you know, he obviously uses hair dye products because nobody that old has hair that black. So he's... An idiot, and he also has no sense of humour whatsoever. Which was funny when they picked him to be the host for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> the, the one episode of Saturday Night Live that's never been repeated because it was so incredibly bad. He just didn't get any of the jokes. I mean, he's that stupid. They would have a read-through on the Wednesday before they uh, filmed it live on Saturday night, because it's called Saturday Night Live. Uh, where they would, because the host, they have a, a guest host every week, and the host gets to pick the sketches and the scenes and the jokes that they want to do. And he just didn't get any of the jokes, so he kept saying, nope, nope, nope. And then he said, I've got an idea for a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> so his idea for a sketch was that he was a psychiatrist, and uh, some actress would walk in, and he would hypnotise her and have sex with her, and then at the end of it say, you have to come back every week. The finest comedy writers in American television at the time had just pitched a whole bunch of jokes and sketches to him that he didn't understand any of them, turned them all down, and that was what he thought was funny. If you get the chance, right, there's an American stand-up comedian called Tom Segura, and he's 
he basically he collects stories about Steven Seagal from people who work with him, and they're all hilarious. As part of his stand-up, I think it was on one of his recent Netflix specials, he did this uh, this bit. It's it's six minutes. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Steven Seagal is out of his mind. <laughs> well worth your time because it's hilarious and it's absolutely true did you know steven seagal is actually a volunteer police officer in the state of louisiana there's a there's a non-zero chance that you could go to louisiana start a fight in a bar and be arrested by steven seagal <laughs> okay anyway enough go and check it out steven seagal is out of his mind search for that on youtube you will not regret it Anyway, back to the back. You know, I was supposed to cut all of this stuff out and actually get to the point, but I've just had so much fun taking the piss out of Steven Seagal. Hopefully you guys did too, because otherwise this has been one hell of a boring video. Anyway, so... Ooh, Sinop over there appears to be in an awful lot of trouble. So, you, you're probably asking yourself, why are we watching this? Because... I mean, Gatman CA hasn't really done an awful lot. He's only got 41,000 damage done and we're nearly halfway through the battle. Yeah, that's true. Which is why I was intending on cutting most of this out. And then I started getting one on about Steven Seagal. But here we are. Now, this is a two-carrier battle. A quick look at the team list will show that there are only nine ships per team. This is a North American server battle. It's probably happening late at night or early morning. It's not the most heavily populated server. So, nine ships per team, double carrier. The only thing that surprises me about this is that the matchmaker hasn't managed to sneak a third carrier onto the enemy team in the shape of a hybrid, making an entire third of the enemy team aircraft carriers. However, Gatman CA is in the USS Missouri, and it does have a fairly powerful anti-aircraft defensive suite. So, I mean, he's already racked up a fair few air kills, even though he hasn't directly come under attack really that much from the enemy carriers yet. Keyword, of course, being yet. The team have just lost their chumfon, and they're down one kill, although it looks like they're about to go down another one because that Jervis is definitely not winning the gunfight with the Angela Merkel over there. Sure enough, the team are now down two kills. Torpedoes and it's ahead. here where the enemy carriers start to think, ooh, that's a nice big fat target. So there's an airstrike from the possible. Enemy destroyer, no longer a torpedo threat, he's already launched in the mist, stuck on the rocks and vulnerable while reversing. Unfortunately, Gatman has the armor piercing loaded rather than high explosive, but still does a substantial amount of damage. Oh, and here comes the Karga with its torpedo bombers. Yep, there they are. And those are all going to hit. That was a well-launched attack from the Karga, caught him pinned up against the island. He needs to get a kill here, though. German destroyers tend to reload their torpedoes pretty quickly. It's difficult to see how he's not going to kill this guy. And they really do need it because the team have just lost one of their carriers. Although, well, there's the kill. And the Franny Takahashi just managed to torpedo and sink the enemy Cleveland. But here come cargo torpedo bombers from the other side. And they hit as well. He's getting shot from over there, too. It's the Johan de Witt. He's down to 8,000 health. He keeps, I mean, he's triggered his heal. He's trying to recover at least some health and attempt to go undetected in this cyclone because visibility is down to only eight kilometers. But I mean, that doesn't mean anything when there's a double carrier in play on the enemy team and you're in something the size of a battleship. You're not difficult to find. There's the AA Defense Expert Award, by the way. He is, unsurprisingly, racking up the aircraft kills. Once he stops shooting aircraft down, we might actually get an accurate tally. Oh, wow, would you look at this? <laughs> oh, and yep, yeah, there's the uh, the airstrike from the Johan de Witt as well. Um, he's up to... Okay, there we go. 57 aircraft kills. Now, admittedly, some of those kills don't matter, because some of the enemy carriers were dropping patrol fighters on him, and they've basically got no health for free kills. They don't matter. Uh, the airstrikes launched by the Johan de Witt. Doesn't really matter how many of those you shoot down. It's a consumable. It, it, as soon as the consumable's off cooldown, it doesn't matter how many aircraft you shot down in the previous wave, they're going to get exactly the same number of aircraft to launch at you every time the consumable's off cooldown. But some of these kills do matter. I know I like to rant about aircraft carriers. 
and I'm not apologising for it because they are overpowered. There's no counterplay against them, and they have way too much influence on the outcome of a battle. And don't take my word for it, Wargaming have said this themselves. There's that famous video clip of uh, the battle influence showing carriers leagues ahead of everything else, announced uh, shortly before the latest wave of buffs to aircraft carriers. <laughs> But the thing is, I mean, while any old idiot can play a carrier and have more influence on the outcome of the battle than if they were playing a destroyer, a cruiser, or a battleship, just by virtue of the fact that we're in a carrier, you still can't just face roll your air attacks all over your keyboard and expect... Well, you can. <laughs> I guess the point I'm making here is, if you're not careful about where you spend your attacks, particularly in the beginning of the battle. At this stage of the battle, at the end, oh, the Takahashi's just gone down, there's now two of them left against three enemies. Uh, one Johan de Witt, which shouldn't be too much of a problem. I mean, this is a Missouri, and Gatman CA has managed to recover a reasonable amount of health, and you know, the Johan de Witt is just a cruiser. So if he can catch him, which is by no means assured. I mean, there's still a cyclone in effect. Visibility is still down to eight kilometers. But if he can catch him, he should be able to spank him. And if he can't catch him, hopefully the surviving carrier on the team can, or can at least spot him in order for Gapman to finish him off. But the point that I was trying to make, oh, there he is. Oh, this has got to be a kill. Spotted by the friendly carrier. Notice that the enemy passable, and this is definitely a kill. But the enemy passable was trying to protect the cruiser. He dropped his patrol fighters on him to see off the uh, the friendly carrier's aircraft. Oh, he's managed to get his airstrike away. <laughs> oh my god, look at this. <laughs> look at this. Holy shit. I mean, those are... Those are dead. Again, you know, he's racking up a lot of kills here that don't matter. He's shooting down patrol fighters. He's shooting down... Uh, strike aircraft from the Johan de Witt. He's now shooting down depth charge attack planes. None of these kills matter, but he has scored a lot of aircraft kills that do actually matter, particularly at this stage of the battle. You can see that the Parsifal no longer has full squadrons to send against him. Too many carrier players make the mistake of thinking, oh, and the Parsifal spotted as well, shot out on piercing. I'm actually taking control of the camera here myself so you can actually see all of the aircraft. I mean, wow. <laughs> oh, that one was dropped too short. Didn't have time to arm. Um, but too many carrier players think that just because they've got magical pixie dust factories laboring away beneath the flight deck generating fresh aircraft, that they can never run out of aircraft. And while that's technically true, it's not like in the old pre-carrier rework RTS style carrier gameplay where every carrier did have a limited number of aircraft and once they were all shot down that was it but you can still effectively if not actually run out of aircraft you can if you just throw your aircraft away at the start of the battle theoretically at least get to the stage although they haven't quite reached it yet and there's another two torpedo hits but you can theoretically get to the stage where anti-aircraft buyer can actually defend <laughs> against airstrikes by shooting down the entirety of the attacking wave. We haven't quite got there yet. I mean, these strikes are still getting through. Solved, and the sir. first strike should get through. I mean, regardless of how strong your AA is, carriers have to have a chance of doing damage. I'll, I will concede that much. Against a lone target like this, which Gapman CA very definitely is. There we go. Okay, he finished off a torpedo bomber squadron. It wasn't the first strike from the Parsifal, it was the second. But the second strike stood no chance of getting through. And the Missouri does have strong AA. I mean, it's no longer the effective no-fly zone that it used to be prior to the aircraft carrier rework. And he's taken so much damage that he probably doesn't have many of his anti-aircraft guns back up. But the enemy carriers don't have full squadrons to throw at him either. And the Karga in particular is infamous for having... Aircraft that don't have a huge amount of hit points, it just has lots and lots and lots of them. Karga's aircraft are not difficult to shoot down. It just throws so many of them at you that most of them are going to get through anyway. But that's only true in the first half of the battle. 
And if the cargo player hasn't been careful in nursing its aircraft reserves, you end up in a situation like this, where instead of throwing massive squadrons at you, composed of individual aircraft that are very easy to shoot down, it's throwing dribs and drabs at you, composed of individual aircraft that are very, very easy to shoot down. In fact, he's actually being forced to use his rocket attack planes, which are easily the worst aircraft available on the cargo, because the rest of his squadrons have been shredded and yet, despite the fact that we can, well, I don't know if it's a fact, but hopefully we can all agree that we're probably not facing the greatest cargo player in World of Warships here, given the fact that he's sitting a couple of kilometers away from a Missouri, getting shot at by 16-inch armor-piercing when there's an, and has been for some time now, when there's an island there he could have been hiding behind, and instead he's just face-rolling his air attacks all over the keyboard. And yet, despite this near total lack of situational awareness, because he's in a carrier, <laughs> <laughs> Gatman's down less than 4,000 health. Actually, you know, if Gatman's not careful, he can still die here. Even if the Karga no longer has enough aircraft to mount a successful first strike against him, he's now in range of the Karga's secondaries. And the Karga's secondaries are no joke. I mean, they don't have any range and they're not very accurate, and most of them are 127mm, but it does have 10 200mm guns. And any of the secondaries can set a fire, although Gatman does have his damage control ready to go. Not that he ended up needing it. Man, that was a struggle. You see how many aircraft he shot down during the course of that battle? Almost all of it in the second half. So it was his teammates who largely depleted these guys of their strike aircraft, but 174 aircraft shot down. Do you know how many aircraft you have to shoot down to get an AA defense expert? 35. He should have gotten four AA defense expert awards. A hundred and... I don't think I've... It's possible. I'm not going to say I've never seen that many aircraft shot down in a game before, but if I have, I can't remember. That is phenomenal. Of course, in order to get that kind of score, you probably have to have a double carrier game. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 4,000 base experience. Holy shit. Gatman's got the two enemy carriers to thank for that. Although, I'm sure he would probably not like to repeat this experience, despite the colossal amounts of base experience that they awarded him. So, yes, that was it for today. Uh, plenty to talk about there in the comments. Hopefully not all of it about Steven Seagal. Although, if you do have any other funny Steven Seagal stories, I would love to hear them. In the meantime, as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.